Without further ado, I'm gonna let Sheila take, it is Sheila, yes, man, it's been a rough morning. Uh, I'm gonna let Sheila take it away. Okay, I don't want to break something. It's okay? Oh, oh amazing. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here despite being Sunday morning. I'm really happy to be here sharing this moment with all of you. And a little bit sleepy, too. <laughs> well, uh, let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Shayla. I'm a Francis Gurdjie researcher because I love writing stuff. I come from Buenos Aires, Argentina, a city. 10,000 kilometers far from here, near the end of the world. <laughs> and also a developer in assembly for microcontrollers and microprocessors, C, C++, Python, and Go. And as a speaker, this is my second time giving a talk at DEFCON. I shot the noob last year. <laughs> and was also a speaker at Black Hat, Echo Party, Hacking the Box, and other security conferences. But let's go to the important thing. Uh, in the last month, there were many, many news about vectors inside hardware boards. We all know that these kind of vectors exist, and they could be inside smartphones, computers, routers, PMCs, and so on. So, vectors, vectors everywhere. <laughs> uh, along the years, have been published many research about different ways of factoring devices through their own hardware components. However, most of those research focuses on devices based on powerful microprocessors like ARM, Intel, or AMD instead of microcontrollers. So let's see some technical differences between them. On one hand, we have microprocessors, which are an entirely CPU. All the components that a microprocessor needs to work, like memories, input and output views, um, are physically separated. They are also bigger than a microcontroller and have greater processing capacity because of their size and separated components. Um, most microprocessors have a modified hardware memory organization and 32 or 64 bits of architecture. And on the other hand, we have microcontrollers. They have inside a little CPU and all the necessary components to get it working. I mean, inside a microcontroller, we have the CPU, RAM, ROM, input and output views, as well as other peripherals. Um, the fact that microcontrollers are putting it all together in a very tiny space makes them with a less processing capacity and slower than microprocessors. There are other technical differences too. Um, micro microcontrollers have hardware memory organization and 16 bits of architecture. They also have a little stack. For example, PIC 18 have a stack able to store up to 31 memory addresses. And if this gets overflow, the PIC will reset itself. Just some information there. <laughs> so, after seeing some technical differences between microprocessors and microcontrollers, a question that could arise is why some would use a microcontroller instead of a powerful microprocessor? Well, um, usually microprocessors are implemented on multitasking devices that need to run an entirely operative system. On the other hand, microcontrollers are used for doing a specific task, usually the same work dealing with the same kind of input and output, like automatizing a routine. It's a less, like comparing a Raspberry Pi, which has a ARM microprocessor, to an Arduino which has an um, Atmel microcontroller. Both are useful devices, but they are used for different purposes. Um, microcontrollers have evolved a lot, and microchip is a clear example. Too many years ago, PIC 12, very simple pinout with basic input and output ports and a few peripherals. PIC 16, um, they have more peripherals. It's, it's more familiar for us, maybe, because some of us have learned to program in microcontrollers using these devices. 
They have more peripherals, including user communication and CCP modules. PK team, also called high performance microcontrollers, are my favorite ones. They have a lot of peripherals supporting different communication protocols like USB, CAN, and so on, as well as all common peripherals such as timers, CCP modules, analog to digital converters, among others. And finally, we have the 32 bit microcontrollers. They are the most similar thing to a powerful microprocessor. Uh, even they use a Cortex M TPU, but still being a microcontroller. So, after all, targeting microcontrollers worth it for. Um, nowadays, they are responsible for controlling a wide range of systems, like physical security systems, sound car circuit, semaphores, elevators, sensors, components of industrial systems, uh, some home appliances. And even robots. This is an example. It's a car CQ that handles the fuel injection and is fully controlled by a PKT microcontroller. So, there are interesting devices to target them to. <coughs> um, all microcontrollers need to be programmed, otherwise, they will do nothing. So, as I said, there is a little CPU inside them which is able to, exec to execute every assembly instruction of a program loaded in the microcontroller's program memory. These are the steps for programming microcontrollers. And we can develop the firmware in assembly or C. And after compiling and assembling it, we're gonna get the hex file, which is the firmware. To load such hex file into the microcontroller, we have to use the programmer's software and hardware, usually provided by the microcontroller's manufacturer. And similar to the world of microprocessors, um, every microcontroller manufacturer has their own assembly instruction set for the CPU of their devices. This is an example to turn it on a, a LED in a PIC microcontroller. I love programming them in assembly, but you can use both uh, assembly or C. For microchip devices, we can use the MPLAB ID, which is free. To develop and compile our firmware. By building the project, we're gonna get the hex file, which is the firmware, ready to be written in the microcontroller's program memory. Um, as I said, there is it's necessary to use the programmer software and, and hardware to, to load the firmware into the microcontroller. These are the microchip official tools. We can use the MPLAB ID or IP. Together with the PK3, uh, and load the firmware into the microcontroller. Uh, the interesting thing is that, as well as these tools can be used to read, sorry, to write the program memory of a microcontroller, they can be used to read the program memory. I mean, we can write a firmware, or we can dump the firmware. So, let's see how we can dump the program memories. More interesting for us. Uh, first of all, this is the memory organization um, for microchip devices. We have the program memory where is the firmware is located and it's the memory that we will dump. But there are other two memories. The RAM memory, which contains the SPR, special function registers, and GPR, general purpose registers. And the ROM memory, where the program can store data that won't be lost after our reset. So, the RAM and program memory are non volatile, while the RAM is, is RAM, is volatile. Uh, to make a memory dump, the first step is connecting the target microcontroller to the PK3. There are other tools for doing this process, but I prefer to use the official tool because it works very well and it's cheap. It costs around $40. So, this is an example of connection. We had to match the pins of the target device, the target microcontroller, with the pins of the PK3 connector. For example, the BPP pin of the microcontroller must be connected to the BPP pin of the PK3, and so on with the other pins. It's, it's very easy. Then, we connect the PK3 to, the, to our computer, and we can use the MPLAB ID to read the firmware. The first step, is create the, a standalone project inside the MPLAB ID 
and specify what microcontroller has our target device. Fortunately, it's very easy to get this information because uh, the PIC model is printed on the microcontroller. And then we must set the programmer hardware, in this case, the PIC3. And finally, we can use this option in the MPLAB ID to read the firmware and dump it into a hex file. The MPLAB ID has a disassembler, so we can uh, load the hex file and go to target memory views program memory, and there we'll see the disassembly view where we can find all the assembly instruction of the firmware together with their respective opcodes to be executed by the CPU and also the memory address is the memory address where each one is located. Let's compare. Um, in one side we have the source code and in the other side the disassembly view. Um, this program after the start has five assembly instructions and we can find them in a disassembly view. The only, it's, it's very, it's almost equal. The only difference is the access word after, after some instructions. It means that uh, data memory access is performed because port D and 3D are special function registers located at the RAM. That's why the access word is present. Um, by observing the, the opcodes, we can match the assembly instruction in the, in the hex dump. They're gonna be better because of the little endian format. Like most microprocessors, microcontrollers use little endian to store bytes in memory. Okay, and uh, now that we learned how to dump a firmware, let's see how we can modify the hex file and reload the firmware with something injected uh, in order to alter the original behavior of the target device. When injecting a payload into a binary or process, it's necessary to find a place where our payload gets executed at least once. In this case, we need the same. So, the next step is to find a place inside the firmware where we could inject a malicious core of payload. I will explain three different injection techniques. The first one is, uh, is about the injecting at the entry point, I mean, when the program starts. Where is the entry point? Well, this is the standard structure of a program for microchip devices. The first four sections are self plain and they are not important for us at this moment. So, let's focus on the reset vector. It is always present in every microchip device at the memory address 0000, zero, zero, zero. and it's followed by a go to start, which is a jump to the first assembly instruction of the program. Basically the entry point. In the middle the interrupt vector is present at the address 8 or 18 but we'll go deeper on that later. Uh, here we can observe a, sh a jump to the entry point in the source code as well as in the disassembly view. Um, this little program does not use interruption so the Gordo in the reset vector is making a very short jump. But in large programs, uh, like this other one, the jump gonna be quite longer. So remember, the reset vector will be always at the address 0000. zero, zero, zero. It's the first line in the disassembly view. There we're gonna find a, a Gordo to the entry point. Um, in the first case, the entry point is at the address 06. And in the second case is at 7F84. Those are the memory addresses where we should inject our payload to get it executed when the program starts. So the next question is what payload we should inject or how can we build a payload for these kind of devices? Well, we have to use the specific assembly instruction set for our target device. This is an example to turn it on two different LEDs in a Pico microcontroller. But we need to get the opcodes of these instructions. An option to get them is by writing all the assembly instructions of our payload in an assembly file inside a standalone project in the MPLAB ID and then compile it so we can see the disassembly view and get the opcodes. Those gonna be the opcodes of our payload but Remember the leader endian format? 
So that's going to be our final payload with the bytes inverter. So we are ready to make the injection. In this example, the entry point is at the address 28. So we have to locate this address in the hexam. Um, we can look for the base memory address first, 20 in this case, and then count until 8 bytes. That is where the entry point is located and where we should inject the op causes our payload. But there is something that we should keep in mind is the checksum. It's at the end of every line, and if we modify something, we must to recalculate it for every affected line. First, first we're going to inject our payload at the entry point. Um, the original byte in that part will be shifted to the right. But remember not to move the byte of the checksum because we're going to recalculate it. This is the method we should do to recalculate the checksum. For example, if we have this line, we should make a sum of all the bytes of the line and then make a not plus one. And the last byte of the outcome gonna be our checksum. But there is always a lifesaver <laughs> and we can use this website to calculate the checksum factly. So remember for every affected line after payload injection, we have to fix the checksum. If we don't, we're gonna get an error at the moment of loading this modified firmware into the target device. Okay, so um, we are ready. We can use the MPLAB ID or IP to load this modified firmware into the target device in the, mic in the microcontroller's program memory of our target device. And what's the result? This is the target device with the original firmware. And this is what happened after loading the modified firmware. Um, the first light is on because it's part of the original program, but there are other two lights on because of our payload. So the proof of concept work. This is like pop a calc but hardware version. So let's see a real case. Um, this is a, a dashboard for observing the behavior of a car CQ. Um, the car CQ is for uh, handle the fuel injection. So we have four blue LED for the four petrol injectors and other four yellow LED or lights for the CNG or CNB injectors. In normal behavior, the EQ starts injecting petrol and then switches on CNG. In the firmware of this car EQ, the entry point is at the address 15 to 8. I place a little payload there to modify the right behavior and continue injecting petrol after switching. I mean, the EQ will be injecting both petrol and CNC at the same time. That must not, must not be cool for the car. So let's see a video. Uh, this is the car CQ and uh, we we start seeing the oh. uh, I will keep the sound because it's very good. So we start seeing the normal behavior, the blue lights are on because the car starts using petrol and then it switched to CNG. So the petrol injector stopped working and the car is using CNG. Now I'm loading the modified firmware into the the microcontrollers of the echo, and I will repeat the process. The, the car starts using petrol. I speed up the car to reaching out the condition to automatically switch to CNC. But when it occurs, the car is using both. The EQ is injecting both petrol and CNC at the same time. This is just an example. Something bad for the car. Okay. Let's talk about the second injection technique. Um, maybe we prefer to get our payload executed not when the program starts, but when a specific action occurs. It might be associated with an interruption. Um, in big programs, there will always be interruptions because of the time the microcontroller can perform to 
interruptions to alert that For example, the times digital converter audio transmission of different communication protocols as other parallels. <laughs> execution flow when occurs. Um, other what the microcontroller is doing, it will interrupt factor. Okay, the address A for high priority interruptions and 18 for low priority interruptions. Once there, a procedure known as is used to detect who triggers the interruption. It's what the timer, the analog to digital converter, or who was. After detecting who was, the corresponding code routine is executed. The red file instruction at the end will show the program counter at the memory address immediately after the instruction before the interruption occurs. There are some special function registers that aim interruption handling. When a program is using interruptions, the bits PIE and PIE of the INCO register will be set to one. In assembly, it looks like this. The BIS, the BIS SF instruction is used for set to one a bit of the register. So, when we dump a firmware, we can look for these two instructions in the disassembly view in order to know if interruptions are enabled in our target device. For every peripheral that could trigger an interruption, there are two bits inside a special register. The interruption enable bit and the interruption flag bit. As example, we can quote the timer zero. Its interruption bits are located in the int con register. When a program wants to use this timer, the TMR0IE bit in the int con register must be set to one. When the timer triggers an interruption, the TMR0IF will be automatically set to one. While not, this flag will be to zero. Uh, due to in the latest microcontrollers, there are too many peripherals. The special registers PI1, PI2, and even PI3 have interruption enable bits, while Peer 1, Peer 2, and Peer 3 have their respective interruption flags for different hardware peripherals. So, as I said, a procedure known as polling is used at the interrupt vector to detect who triggers an interruption. Uh, this process is done using the BTFSC instruction for testing the value of the interruption flags. In this example, we have four peripherals that could have triggered an interruption. The polling process will start testing the flag of one of them. If the flag is set to one, the call below will be done, jumping to a call routine that must be executed every time that this specific peripheral triggers an interruption. If not, the polling will continue testing the other flags until find the flag set to one. This is how the polling process looks in the disassembly view. By inspecting the polling, we are able to know what peripherals are being used for our target device. Remember that the polling will be always located at the address 8 for high priority interruptions or 18 for low priority. <coughs> if we do some in one of the interruption flags, we observe that the bit 5 is being tested of the peer 1 register. But what is the bit 5? And um, in the data sheet of our target device, we found that the bit file corresponds to the RC interruption flag. This is used by communication peripherals when, when the microcontroller receives data from any communication protocol, it will trigger an interruption that will set this specific flag to one. In the polling process, if this flag is to one, the call will be executed jumping to a core routine that must be executed, in this case located at the address 48. Such core routine will do something with the data received by this peripheral. So, um, by inspecting the polling, we not only know what peripherals are being used, but we can get different memory addresses where we could inject our payload. For example, if we want to do something when 
the microcontroller receives data from a communication protocol, we should inject our payload at the RC interruption routine. Um, in this case, it's located at the address 48. Or if we want to do something when the timer 0 triggers an interruption, we should inject at the address 4E, and so on. The idea is to be able to modify the, the original behavior of the target device when the microcontroller is using its different hardware peripherals. So let's see an example of factoring the user communication using this technique. The first step is locating where the RC interruption routine begins. By inspecting the polling, we got that in this case the memory address is 48. So we have to locate this memory address in the hex dump. So we can look for the base memory address 40 and then count until 8 bytes. And there is where the RC interruption routine begins and where we should inject our payload. But what payload? But we'll cook a payload that makes our relaying of the received data to a transmission port that we are able to monitor externally. I mean, the microcontroller will receive data from anywhere and it will trigger an interruption. At that moment, our payload will be executed to catch such information and relay it to us. This is the payload. Um, first, we cut the received data and we move it to the W register. Then, the, the transmission is enabled, the operation mode is set as a synchronous, and the TX pin is set as an output. And finally, we move the received data in W to the TX drive. Anything written in such register will be transmitted through the TX pin to a USB interface or wireless module. In my case, I will use a, a USB interface because it's easier to show you what happened, but it could be a wireless module. This instruction could vary a little depending on the target device. These are the opcodes of every assembly instruction and our final payload. <coughs> So we are ready to make the injection. Um, we have to inject the, the payload of factor when where the RC interruption routine begins. So in this case it's at the address 48. And we'll place the, the payload in the same way that we did in previous examples. So let's see a demo. In the next video you will see a hoverboard receiving information from a smartphone. That's when the interruption occurs and the data is relayed to our computer. Okay, um, the vector firmware has been loaded in the target device and we are listening to the USB interface. So we send a message to the hardware board. That's when the interruption occurs and the information is relayed to our computer. So as I said, I'm using a USB interface in this case, but it could be replaced by a wireless mo module for remote connection and it's gonna work in the same way. Nice. Okay, um, at the moment of injecting a payload at whatever place, we are making a shift in a byte that could affect the call and go to instruction of the original program. Because now they are jumping to memory addresses whose original bytes have been moved. In large programs, this is a real problem that we have to solve. For example, in the graph, we can see a call instruction jumping to the address 10, while after payload injection, it should be jumping to the address 16. We have to fix this to avoid a flow corruption. These are the opcodes of Gordo call and NOP instructions. In PK thin microcontrollers, the assembly instructions are 16 bits in length. So 8 bits are used for, for the opcode and 8 bits for the memory address where it has to jump to. But two more bytes are reserved in case of needing jumping more than two, 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 uh, sorry, 255 positions. 
Uh, this, this we can, here we can see an example of Gordon and Cole. The first jump is to the offset 6 and the second one to the offset 467. Um, in the disassembly view we're gonna see the memory address. So we have to make uh, we have to divide it by 2 to get the offset and then be able to locate the jump in the hex down. To fix it we have to keep in mind the memory address where we have injecting our payload and the payload length. And we have to fix only those jumps to memory addresses located after the one where we have injected. For example if we inject our payload at the address 48 and we have a call at 56 we have to recalculate the jump by making a sum of the original memory address plus the payload length. So in log, in log programs we'll probably need to fix some jumps. In this case I have to fix three call instructions. Um, make the injection, fix the jumps and recover the checksum might be tedious especially in large programs. Um, that's why I'm working on a little tool for automating this process. The tool receives as parameter the hex dump, the payload, the offset where it has to be injected and the name of the output file and basically the tool makes the injection and fix all the necessary things. I hope to be able to publish this tool on my GitHub in these days. <coughs> so stay tuned. Oops. So let's talk about the last second, last sorry, the last injection technique. Um, I will explain how we can alter the microcontrollers stack and take control of the program flow. In microchip devices there are four special function registers to manipulate the stack. The first one contains the stack pointer and the TOSU, TOS and TOSU compose the top of the stack. In the graph we can see an example. The stack pointer is pointing to the second entry of the stack. Uh, which is value is 001834. In practical implementation of these registers, uh, first we should increment the stack pointer and then write the TOS registers with the, mem with the memory address where we want to jump to. And finally, we have to execute our return. This is how it looks in, the in, as in assembly. First we increment the stack pointer and then we write all the necessary values to the TOS registers. In this case to jump to the address 0000 0072. And finally is the return. In the disassembly view we're gonna see something like this. When, when the return is executed the program will jump to the memory address 24 in this case. From this example we can get the opcode of these instructions. So regarding payload injection at this moment we have two alternatives. On one hand we could inject our payload anywhere inside the firmware and then write the TOS registers with the corresponding memory address. Or well we can do a rock chain writing the TOS with memory addresses from part of the code that we want to execute. I mean create the payload with assembly instructions already written in the original program. <coughs> this is an example of ROP. Um, at the left we see all the memory addresses of our ROP gadgets. That means the memory addresses from parts of the code that we want to execute. And in, in the other side we see all the necessary opcodes to write the memory addresses in the stack. All all those opcodes including the final red will compose our payload. Um, microcontrollers use a LIFO stack too. So the first ROP gadget executed will be the one located at the address 28 in this case. It's the last one injected in the ROP chain. This is an example of ROP gadget. It starts at the address 40 and ends at 46 with a retail W. All gadgets must end Turn or retail W to continue executing the other gadgets in, in the right way. So let's see a demo start. Um, in the next video, you will see a light turning on 
for every rob catch being executed. It's a nice way that I found to show what happened. Okay, it's inverted, but you can observe eight gadgets being executed. Of course, they could be more or less, but it's just an example. So, finally, let's talk about uh, memory protections. Um, from a security point of view, we cannot avoid that someone overwrites the whole program memory of our microcontroller. We can protect it against memory dumps and with that avoid payload injections. Um, at the beginning of a program before the main code, it's necessary to set some configuration bits for microchip devices. Among them is the code protection bit. But by enabling only these ones, the memory dumps will work. So if you assemble your program with these specific code protections, um, uh, anyone else will be able to dump your program and disassemble it. So, to prevent memory dumps, we have to use the boot protection, which is the CPV bit, and also the data protection is useful too. If we enable these two bits, um, program memory dumps won't work, and if someone tries to dump your firmware, the hex file will contain only zeros. This is just an example of protection for microchip devices. Really, I don't have, I didn't have time to to get deep in, in protections, but it's something that you can do. Uh, conclusions: Vectoring microcontroller is possible, and there are a lot of interesting devices that are fully controlled by them. Um, I explained three different injection techniques. I wrote a white paper explaining each, each one of them in details. Um, and though I focus on microchip, I think that most concepts can be extended to other vendors. And finally, I want to thank to Sol and Nico Weissman for their help while I was writing the white paper, and also to the people of Dreamlab for all the support. And thanks to you.